corporate life. I am paid by Rackspace to go around the world and interview tech startups and in innovators and study the future. Uh, in many businesses, they would call that a strategist, I guess, right? Only Rackspace says, don't bring that learning internal. Put it on YouTube. <laughs> Make it open source so that everybody can see what we're learning. And Rocky and I go around the world, and just like last week, a couple of the meetings that we had, um, we went to Autodesk, and Autodesk is doing some really mind-blowing things. <laughs> so uh, we saw three things that were pretty mind-blowing there. First, they uh, have a uh, software program that lets them uh, mate buildings. In other words, buildings can have sex. <laughs> and so you could put, uh, first of all, you can uh, scan like the Buckingham Palace with these, uh, a, about a $10,000 laser scanner and digitize the Buckingham Palace and then do the same thing for the White House. You put those two buildings into their program and it'll create hundreds of offspring in different kinds of buildings. And uh, the program itself will tell you which offspring is more, most likely to survive an earthquake or which offspring has the lowest energy utilization or which offspring is best in a storm. And it, it's just mind blowing what you can do now with digital technology to scan. By the way, these lasers, when you scan them, they know the reflectivity of the materials that the laser hits. So it knows whether you're looking at glass or steel or marble or whatnot. It's pretty, pretty crazy. So that was one thing. Second thing is I, I didn't realize the levels of what is happening in the 3D printing world. Um, they, they showed me little parts, metal parts that are used in Porsche engines that are 3D printed now. And when you think about what it costs to make that part in the old world, you had to send your CAD program over to China, have a mold made that cost about $50,000, have the part sent back to you, which was uh, you know a few weeks, right? That's how things worked in the old world. And you would get the part and it wouldn't be right, so you'd have to redo it and spend another $50,000 and wait for another test part to come back to you, and it, 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 it took a long time. Now you just print that part out, and in a few hours, you have the part. You don't have to wait for the shipping and whatnot. The CTO of uh, Autodesk said, um, what has just happened to the world is uh, complexity is free. And he said, that's a pretty mind-blowing concept to think about. Um, and he, he showed many, many examples of, of what, what that meant. And the third thing that was really crazy was they're raising uh, digital bacteria. So they. Uh, Raise digital bacteria and using cloud computing, they're able to evolve the digital bacteria millions and millions of times. And they're coming up with new uh, materials and new designs that the bacteria that evolved in the computer is designing it. That, that was uh, even a little too weird for me, but the materials were cool and we're gonna see that stuff. The, back to the 3D printing, they had the uh, Nike shoes there that they made for Olympic athletes. Nike has a machine that custom builds shoes for the foot type and the running type or the athlete's type. They're contextual shoes, and that gets to what I'm seeing with Rocky. We're about to enter an age into an age of context. Uh, and, and what do I mean by that? We're seeing the number of sensors that are on us going up exponentially, right? We have seven sensors on our cell phone. Next year, we're going to have Google Glasses, which will have another seven sensors. We're wearing uh, Nike fuel, ba fuel bands that have three sensors. Uh, the Basis watch is coming out next week that has 22 sensors, and on and on. These sensors are kicking data off into the cloud and letting us do all sorts of fun stuff with that. The second thing we're seeing is wearable computing is going up, right? Uh, the Google Glasses, the Project Glass is, is <coughs> my favorite example, uh, and that comes out next year. Uh, we're seeing new and weird databases, so uh, everything from NoSQL databases like MongoDB to newer and crazier graph databases and uh, high-speed uh, databases like Couchbase. It seems like every three weeks somebody calls me up and says they have a new database to do something strange and weird in this new big data environment. The fourth thing is our social networks are evolving very, very rapidly. They're becoming more mature. 
and they are becoming platforms that we can build apps on top of. Highlight is a good example of that. Anybody here on Highlight? A couple of people, yeah. So Highlight takes, uh, shows the other users who are within 100 yards of me uh, and shows me your Facebook friends that you have in common with me and your Facebook likes that you have in common with me. That's a new kind of application that wasn't possible before Facebook. And the fifth thing is mapping. And you're seeing this war between Apple and Google over mapping. Why, why did Apple have that uh, impulse to get rid of Google's uh, maps on the, all of our digital devices? If, if Google controls the map, they control the context of who we are, where we are, what we're experiencing. And Google will have a stranglehold noose on the neck of Apple. And Apple had to uh, escape that. So we're, we're heading into a new world of context where we're going to see new toys come out. There's a new toy called Toy Talk. Did anybody see that they just got $16 million? Toy Talk started by the former CTO of Pixar. And this, this toy is an example of what I mean by context. You're gonna, your kids are going to start this toy up. They're going to hold Thomas the Tank Engine in front of the iPad because it'll be an app on the iPad. It'll recognize that toy through the sensor, right, through the camera. And then it will go off to the internet and look at various databases or APIs and bring context back. For instance, one of them, one of the simple ones is weather. So it'll go out to a weather service, find the weather for where that iPad is, like here, and it'll say, oh, it's raining outside. Let's play a rainy day, day game. And it'll behave differently based on the context of where that device is used. And that, that's going to happen to all sorts of things. And our experience is Siri is going to not be stupid the way it is right now. Right? I just was at Flipboard on Friday, and, and Mike McHugh talked to me about how stupid Flipboard is. Because you know Flipboard uh, doesn't know that I'm going to San Francisco tomorrow. It doesn't change its behavior. In, in the future, it will. It'll know this because it'll look into Gmail and into my calendar and know that I'm traveling tomorrow and I'm going to change my location. Therefore, it should change the information that it, that it presents to me. Um, and on the company side, you know, when, when I talk to like CEOs uh, at, at companies, they're saying that the world of, of what used to be called business intelligence is going to change to contextual business intelligence. In other words, it, it, you know, five years ago was good enough just to know that you sold a widget. Now you need to know who bought that widget. What, you know, why did they buy it? Who influenced them? And we're seeing all these social services to track buying behavior and who you are. If you search, for instance, on edmunds.com and you're searching for cars, uh, it's 11 o'clock. If you search from a car dealership, it already today shows you different advertising than if it, you search at home. Because it knows you're about to buy a car when you're at the car dealership and they're willing to spend a lot more to get you off that lot and into another dealership. Um, and they can tell you're there. That's a very different thing. So anyways, we're going to have a fun panel. Um, we're going to start a little bit early. I'm very happy to have you on stage. Julie Mayer is Entrepreneur of the Year from Ernst & Young, among a, among a long list of things. So tell me, uh, introduce a little bit of who you are. And, and so uh, um, basically, I'm Julie Meyer, and I run Ariadne Capital. Ariadne has four businesses, actually. We have a 20 million sterling digital fund, so we invest in what we refer to as digital enablers, so enabling tech and tools at the seed stage, primarily here in the UK. Thank you, I appreciate that. Primarily here in the UK, so we invest in digital enablers, enabling tech and tools, the kinds of applications that are going to transform big industries. So our whole kind of uh, investment thesis is that this is not a time of kind of new the installation of new technologies and so forth, but the stuff that is going to transform the large industry, whether that's parking, shipping, automotive, financial services, media, etc. And uh, so that's the way that we're looking. So we're looking to, to back, if you will, digital cars and then to put them on a highway. And most of the, um, you know, most 
entrepreneurs, I dare say, are probably thinking about um, you know, where they're going to get their distribution. They think, you know, which smartphone, marketplace, etc. But we think that actually the big thing, the big opportunity is to help some of those quote unquote boring corporates who need, by the way, rack space to open them up to be not just a highway, but a highway that can interact with the cars, those digital cars that are going to zoom down the highway. So we have a corporate advisory business that helps to do some of that partnering, matchmaking, you know, help the larger Goliath understand how to deal with David the entrepreneur. And then we have a business called Entrepreneur Country, and I wrote a book called Welcome to Entrepreneur Country, which describes probably what everybody in this room understands, that the world is going through a structural change, right? And we're not afraid of that change, because we understand that technology expands the pie, right? This is how more people become prosperous, more opportunity, and so forth. We know that technology lifts it up and takes it forward. Uh, so we describe that with Entrepreneur Country, and in my book, and in the, in the, you know, the conferences, and the blogs and we're internationalizing it and so forth. So those are the kind of different elements of our of our business. It's all really around follow the, following the entrepreneur. A lot of people are looking lots of different directions to try to figure out where do we go? You know, who do we listen to? Where's the growth and so forth? And we just simply say follow the entrepreneur because they are the ones, whether by dint of just sheer intelligence or ingenuity or some unique life experience or the last job that they had, like you said, the CTO of Pixar, by virtue of that, he sets up his next business and so forth. For whatever reason, the entrepreneurs that go out there are driven by an idea that they feel compelled to bring from the future into the present. And most importantly, um, they're willing to live abnormal lives in doing it, right? Not everybody wants to do that, but there's a group of people who are willing to live abnormal lives to, to bring it to life. The stuff that's flashing in your face, by the way, we're uh, uh, using le leaderboarded and we're displaying a social media board and you should use the hashtag BYS and event, BYS event uh, to get on the, on the board. Um, where do we want to go with this Cause it, before uh, they all get here? The challenges for um, entrepreneurs are, are, one, they're having to keep up with this new technology coming out very quickly. I, I, had, uh, I talked with the uh, head of business development at Foursquare, for instance, and they're renting out their API to all sorts of in innovators who are doing things with location. So now you need to know a, a business development guy just to build your product, right, at, at other services like, like Foursquare or food spotting or yeah. on and on and on. And then you need to know the person probably at Apple or Google. How can you know everybody? How can you know everybody you need to know? You know, I think it's really important to remember that innovation and success in innovating is doesn't come down to technology. It comes down to economics. Otherwise, we'd all be, you know, in the Concorde, flying the Concorde. We're not. We're, we're thrown into jumbo jets. Ultimately, the people who win are the people who organize the economics of what they go after. How many of you have heard of monetize? I'm hoping everybody here. Yeah. Okay. So, what? Why did monetize? Oh, you're good at it. <laughs> you're paying for. Oh, you're paying for dinner tonight. <laughs> Mon monetize. You know, is now listed. It's worth about six hundred million dollars. And what Alistair Lukies and and uh, and his his leadership team have done there over the past decade is they've created the economics for the mobile banking ecosystem. And he said something very very basic at the beginning. He said, if this, meaning the mobile banking world that he could see from the future, bring it into the year 2002, when everybody else was just selling software to the banks, right, trying to do mobile banking payments, mm -hmm. Alistair said a very simple thing, he says, this has to work for everyone. The mobile carriers, the banks, the individual needs a lower cost of capital vis-a-vis -vis Western Union, who will charge you 22 percent if you're, if you're poor, and they said, and we'll create those economics and we'll just sit in the middle and take a cut of every transaction that goes through, right? So that's what we refer to as ecosystem economics. But I think it's important to, you know, to recognize the world has gone network, it's no longer linear, and if in any way you're still thinking linear about how you sell or hierarchical, if you're thinking top down, bottom up, if you're thinking stick, not carrot, it's all about aligning incentives. And whenever it gets difficult, and it always kind of, you have those moments where it gets difficult and you have your near-death near -death experiences or whatever, you have to ask yourself a very basic question. In whose interest is it for me to be successful? Because there's always somebody who you could refer to as a natural ally. The problem is, is that sometimes those guys are very unsexy and uncool. And you say, well, I don't want them to be my natural allies. 
but they, they, have a, they need a new story. They might be your highway. They might have a problem, but they, they, they can bring something to you. So you have to think strategically about in whose interest is it for me to be successful? Reach out to those people. And then the winners, as I said earlier, are the people who take the time, and sometimes it takes a decade, like it did with Monetize, to build the business model where everybody wins. Because when you do that, and you go from a moment of kind of profound vulnerability in a network world when you're trying to do that, because you could get squashed like a mosquito on the sidewalk, but if you actually make it across, you get the lock-in of the network effects for doing it. And why does anybody make it across, monetize or LinkedIn or, or any of these success stories that do? It's because the guys from the ancien regime, the last era, underestimate the guys coming up, right? in the kind of asymmetrical game of warfare that entrepreneurship and innovation is, the big guys look at the young guys and say, you can't be serious. You're kidding me. He looks 12 years old. He can't do it. What do you mean? Create the ecosystem for mobile banking payments? It's going to be big company, big company, big company, big company. And they never think that the guy who has the gall, the audacity, to build the new ecosystem <coughs> wins until he does, until it's too late, until he gets that lock-in. You see the Uber or the Halo <laughs> truck companies, and they're tearing apart the cab industry, and now they're pushing back, right? That's right. It's called the creative destruction. That's it. There's going to be two themes out of this panel. Uh, one, how do you get a story that resonates uh, with the market? Mm -hmm. And two, how do you uh, ensure that you have that passion to last? Mm -hmm. Because if Airbnb had dropped out at day 995, mm -hmm. they would not have been Airbnb. Their business took that long to start working. Sure. Well, you know, um, again, Alistair is unfortunately my favorite entrepreneur, so I use his name in vain quite a lot. But I'll never forget this uh, text message I got from him. It was the summer of 2006. I think it was July. And, and uh, it was a Friday night at about 9 p.m. And I get this text message that said, 119 meetings, 76 nights away from my wife, but tonight Monetize has a client. And that's what it takes. And that's the irrational, obsessive behavior that it takes. Most people give up, as you say, after the five to 10 meetings. Nobody is so stupid as to just keep on going back and keep on convincing and influencing and so forth. And Alistair found those guys inside of the banks. And he didn't say, I'm going to disrupt the hell out of you. He said, I'm your friend. I'm going to enable you to get into the world of mobile money. And because he was so emotionally intelligent, he was able to help them into that, into that next paradigm. So, you know, I, I think it's just a whole lot of, it's soft power. I mean, how many of you saw that? Is it Mononcle? What's the, the Mononcle or, you know, the, the Tyler Brule publication just has put UK at the top, right? Dethroned the US in terms of soft power. I think it's a total sign of the times that the United Kingdom, who is at the core of the Anglosphere, I don't think that the Anglosphere's core is in Silicon Valley. I think it's right here in London. And the world's gone network. I think we understand soft power. I think we totally understand how to organize the economics of the Anglosphere world that we operate in. And that, that center of gravity is right here. Not Austin, Texas. Not San Francisco. It's here.